support at the cloud. And um, well, thank you for, for joining us for our, uh, our March call. Looking, looking forward to uh, our discussions tonight. Um, and thank you all those who had submitted questions in advance. Um, and there've been a number, a lot of variety. You know, we've been doing this for over, you know, four years now. And it's, it's, I think, somewhat surprising. We continue to get new questions on, on a regular basis. So again, feel free to uh, ask any questions as, as we move along as well. But I thought I'd share something with you also uh, as I was working on my, uh, my BJ8. Um, one of the things I said, well, I'm going to look at my, I, I took my rear brake drums off. And I'm not sure if you can see that in that picture. But on the right-hand side, look how much thicker it's set up there compared to over on the left-hand side. So I had sent my brake drums down to Alan Hendrick, Hendrick's Wire Wheels down in North Carolina. Alan's been on this call before as a special guest. Uh, and it was out by over six ounces. And uh, he was saying it was really never going to get that properly balanced. Um, so fortunately, Alan did have a spare um, brake drum for me. He said my right one was good shape. And it was only two ounces out. And uh, the, uh, the, the new one that I was able to, a used one that I was able to get from Alan to be able to do the same with that. But uh, one of the things that those of you with BJH, you're kind of known for scuttle shake, where you get around 55, 60 miles an hour, you get shaking through there. Um, so a couple of different things that are really helpful for that. And Ken Beck's on, uh, I had my wire wheels and tires shaved by Ken a couple of years ago, and it made a significant difference to the scuttle shake. Uh, but I think we'll also see once I get these uh, rear drums properly balanced and back on the car that'll make it even better so i'm i'm looking forward to looking forward to that yeah pete pete this Please. is ken we uh we computer balance uh, brake drums also great thanks ken and, and you've experienced good things with that oh yeah yep. yep excellent good so I, I mean is this pretty typical what you see for for brake drums out as bad as this one was very common yep yep yeah, so, I had my well, three drums uh, balanced also uh, in Canning, Connecticut, and uh, uh, the guy down there did a great job. Not many people do it around here. Right. <laughs> well, Ken's not that far away. He's just down down in Pennsylvania, so uh, he's uh, he, he's one that can handle that as well. Well, so. I'm in Stockbridge, Mass., so it's quite a ways away. Uh, that's why you have UPS. Dave Siwa will fly it right down from Western Mass down to Ken Beck's office. No problem at all. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that right, Dave? <laughs> That's right. That's right. We, we're out of Albany. We're out of uh, Bradley. We're out of uh, wherever you want. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing that now and we'll come back to we'll get some, some other questions going mm -hmm. on here. So let's, um, let's jump into a, a couple. Uh, so Rich Ray, I see you're on the call. Um, so Rich was asking um, any recommendations for obviously his car been been put up for the for the winter, but any recommendations for getting his car started coming out of the coming out of the long winter. So any thoughts or recommendations for bringing a car out of uh, hibernation, so to speak. So Rich, have you had a battery tender on there? Have you used Stabil in there? Yes, and yes. Yes, I, I just thought maybe uh, I have started it in the past. Um, when when the, when the fuel pump starts pumping after sitting all winter, it, I, does it fully charge the car the carburetors? Uh, are the carburetors the the pots full on them and, and ready to go, or uh, giving them a little uh, maybe a shot of of uh, starting fluid? Is that okay? Any folks have any recommendations for uh, Rich no. regarding starting fluid or? or... No, I, w what I do is I put some uh, stabilizer in the fall. Uh, I charge the battery up in the spring, which I'm gonna do probably next week. And uh, she should fire up. I wouldn't use any of that stuff. If everything is good with that car, no, I wouldn't do anything. In Rich, has it been in a dry garage? Yeah, not heated, but uh, certainly dry. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, okay. I don't think it got below freezing all winter out there. It's attached. So, uh, I rolled it around a little bit so it didn't get flat spots on the tires, but I, I have not started it uh, since, uh, I guess, December. 
or uh, November maybe. I don't know. It's just been sitting there. And uh, I thought, uh, um, you know, I don't want it, to, it's the first time it starts in the uh, spring, it, it, it takes a little turning over, but it does get going on its own. So I thought maybe this time I'd use a little starting fluid. Yep, you, you shouldn't need starting fluid, but I would recommend having somebody watch underneath the car. Uh, it, a lot of times the, the floats will stick or else a float will fill up with fuel over the winter and you'll pump a good puddle of gasoline underneath the car. Okay, good thing. Yeah, good to know. I, I'll probably back it out. Uh, I might back it out. Uh, when is it? Thursday? It's supposed to hit the high 50s up here. So uh, we go back it out in the driveway and start it outside. Did you did you put it away with a full tank of gas? Yeah, I did. I topped it off. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's good to do that, uh, Rich. Okay. I changed the oil in the fall. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but I did. No, it. it is. <laughs> uh, okay. I think you're doing all, all the uh, all the right stuff, Rich. So um, let's uh, let's go to another. If you don't have any other questions, Rich, at the moment. No, I'm good. Um, so Ted Cryer had uh, some questions regarding um, looking for ign ignition switch. Excuse me for his uh, his BN1, and he's found. Uh, through uh, Triple C accessories, uh, replacement, including NOS keys. So Ted, you wanna give us uh, some updates as it relates to that? Yeah, I, 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 I didn't need to switch because actually I had two in an old box, but um, my wife gave me for Christmas some uh, blank uh, special keys that have the Healy crest on the top of them, very nice. And I was gonna have to get them cut. Um, but the problem I started off with is my BN1 didn't have uh, a Lucas switch in it. It had been replaced in the past by a, uh, an aftermarket type of, I'll say, American switch. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to use the key, and I thought it was a good opportunity to put, restore it to a uh, true Lucas switch. And I, I had two of them, and I looked at the numbers on one, and act, it actually matched the correct uh, Lucas key from a 1955 Lucas parts catalog I have uh, for wow. a BN1, but I didn't have a key. And that is an FA code. And the keys that I got, that she got me were FS codes. And I had another switch for a Lucas that looked the same, but it's an FP code. So lots of uh, switches, but no keys. So uh, I looked at the uh, uh, Triple C's website and they offer, if you need a replacement key or a spare key, they offer uh, key blanks. Uh, they, uh, you can get the crested key for the Healy. And if you wanted it cut to the code of the key in your car or the switch in your car, it's $9.95. And wow. I think most of you might know that the, uh, on the front of your switch, it says like FP905 or something like that. Uh, they also have uh, the barrel and two key assemblies. Uh, for either $14.95 or $24.95, depending upon which. Uh, and they have them for all the English cars. And they also have uh, new old stock keys that are the Wilmot Breeden Union keys with the numbers on them. <clears throat> so the first thing I, I did to try to figure out what I needed is I ordered two of the NOS keys and they were 20 bucks a piece, but they're all cut and they have the numbers on them just like the original keys and they worked fine. <clears throat> and then I knew what I had. So I returned the FS one that maybe <laughs> works in a BJ8 or something else. And, um, and they're gonna cut the uh, replacement crested keys for the FA code. So um, kind of a long story, but uh, it was a good source to get keys and you hate to lose one. So I'm gonna have plenty of them. But uh, if you're not <laughs> familiar with Triple uh, C, They've been around a long time. They also can supply all the little wire connectors, Lucas wire connectors, uh, the little brass like hats that go over the wires and the, uh, <clears throat> the round plastic sockets that the wires go into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a lot of other stuff like that. And they have uh, hats and, and they also have the Lucas uh, lamps and sockets for the lamps. So a lot of nice stuff that they've got there. Um, but for the keys, I thought it was pretty interesting if you ever need a key for replacement or you lose one or something. 
Thanks, that. Ted. Yeah. Can you put the website in the chat? Or is it just CCC or something? Or? It's triple C, C okay. now. Um, okay. It's triple dash C, motor accessories. And they even have keys for old Porsches. <laughs> you have one of those too, Ted? No, I, I don't, no, no. Okay. <laughs> strictly British. Well, I see Bob Britton's on. He's got an old Porsche. Yeah. So, uh, well, well, thanks <laughs> for sharing that, Ted. And... Uh, <laughs> If uh, yeah, we'll, if someone can uh, look that up, we'll get that posted on the uh, on the chat group. That would be great. So, Dave Baruby, I believe you're on, right? Yes, I am, Pete. Thanks for joining, and thanks sure. for your question. So, uh, Dave's interested in uh, possibly putting a reduction starter. Dave's got a BJ8 as our call. Is that correct, Dave? That's correct. 60, yep, BJ8. Yep. And uh, so, just looking for some advice or recommendations as it relates to that. And with a reduction starter, does that change anything as it relates to your wiring? So anyone have experience with reduction starters and pros, cons, and any changes that would be required for wiring? Pete, I have installed a number of reduction starters in, in BJ8s and six-cylinder cars. I've never put one in a four-cylinder car, but I've done it in a number of, of six-cylinder cars. Um, so many, in fact, that I keep the reduction starters in stock because wow. people will show up and they, they want them. So. so anyway, the wiring is not a hassle. Uh, it's a simple matter of changing the position of the white wire with the red stripe on it that goes to the spade terminal on your starter solenoid down to the spade terminal on the reduction starter. Otherwise, the wiring is pretty much straightforward. Uh, the diagrams that come with them will tell you exactly what to do. I find that they use a lot less amperage when they're cranking cars over. Um, it sounds like they're spinning the engine a lot faster, but I have read that their RPMs really after the reduction is about the same as the Healy starter. So they're not spinning it faster. They are just using a lot less amperage to turn it over so you have a, a stronger spark, if you will. Um, I have run into situations where I have to kind of take the reduction starter apart a little bit and re-clock the, the, the flange on it so that the wire, so that the solenoid that's built on top will stick out and you can get to the wire terminals a little better and make it so that it'll fit onto the, onto the flange of the, of the uh, rear engine plate better, but it's pretty self-explanatory when you look at where at the your old starter versus the steer reduction starter, and look at the two bolts that have to be removed so you can reclock the, the flange on the gear reduction starter. Uh, I don't have one on my car, but if my starter starts giving me problems, I will probably do the same same thing. Now, can those be put on both positive ground and negative ground cars, Bob? The starter doesn't make any difference. Okay. It will turn the same direction no matter which way the electricity comes from. Okay. So doesn't make any difference, positive or negative ground. Okay. Peter, it's Nick. Anyone else? Have uh, Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I put one on my car probably 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, the only thing I had to do is, like uh, Bob just said, I had to take the two bolts out and rotate it to make it a little more convenient to, to get it where it belonged, but uh, it's not a big deal. It works good. Great. Yeah, I have one you on my VN1. It. it came with it and always worked just great. Nope. Pete, can I share a little story, Pete? Please. Okay, so gentlemen, what I did this fall is I pulled the engine out of my Healy. I uh, did a little bit of work to the seals and pan, et cetera. I have a hoist, as you can see, behind me. So, of course, the car was up and down. It made it quite easy to do the task of just pulling the engine out. But every time I got in to have a look to clean around the bell housing or to replace the, uh, the throwout bearing, it was this big black cable for the starter that was hanging down. So I stuffed it between the brake line and the frame. What I then did a month and a half later I happened to be checking something out when I put the four-way flashers in the car while I was waiting on some engine parts. 
I reached into the trunk and I turned the friggin' battery off uh -oh. on again. And I am positive. I'm negative ground on the car. You, yeah, Pete, you know what happened, eh? Fellas, I took the battery, which is wired to the car, negative ground, and I took the positive side of the battery and I rammed it, had it stuffed between the brake line and the frame. You should have seen the activity that was going on up in the front of the car. I mean, there was smoke, there was excessive heat. The brake line turned cherry red. Oh, um, it was quite an ex. And I, and I first, so right away, of course, I, I turned the power off. I grabbed the fire extinguisher on the wall over here, and I'm underneath and I'm looking and I see no no flame. And I I'm trying to figure out what the Christ has gone wrong. So I reached up at the battery cable to move it no. away. And it was probably at, just at the point where it would have melted. Eh? I mean, it was that hot. Bottom line is when I stuffed it between the frame and the brake line, I shorted the battery. As soon as I turned that switch on, the battery wow. was shorted right to the frame. It was a, it was a learning exercise. <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> hey, Pete. Yeah. I know in Summit 2018 in Beverly, and either Bob Abbott or Bob Britton can, can remind me, we had a guy from New Hampshire that was selling the uh, gear reduction uh, starters. Is he still around, you know? A guy from New Hampshire? Not the distributor guy, was it? No, no, no. He he was a, he was selling uh, gear reduction starters. I think Bob oh. Britton might have known who he was. Uh, um, I I don't recall. The only guy I know is Gustafson down in um, Gloucester uh, or Beverly. Oh, Matt might have been the guy. Is he yeah. still is he still around? Oh yeah, oh yeah. He sells them. He advertises in most of the you know car you know car magazines and everything. i think his prices were you can cheaper buy him directly um you can buy them directly from him the yeah, guy in gloucester makes them he well, makes a manufacturer up in gloucester that makes the gear reduction starter okay well that's my point i think it, they were cheaper from him than if you went to a moss or somebody else okay yeah so dave have you actually got, gotten your gear reduction starter yet uh yes i have okay Okay. Um, just to go back to the gentleman that was going to start his car. Well, that's what I tried to do about a week and a half ago um, and uh, cranked a little bit. And then all of a sudden it stopped cranking. And uh, so I had my roommate, AKA my wife come out <laughs> and uh, clicked over the starter for me. And uh, I checked, I was getting juice down to the starter. And then when it was, when, when it was engaged to start, I could hear a hum coming out of the starter. So it was like, well, okay, I, you know, I had an issue. So I figured I would just go with this reduction starter instead of having it rebuilt and so forth. But so I, I did swap it out. Okay. It, and, does, and did it work? Oh yeah. Yeah. It worked oh, very well. Oh, oh good. Okay. okay. Just a, another, a quick question on that or an item was um, getting the starter out. Uh, you know, the two bolts, pretty straightforward, but then lifting the starter out through the engine bay. That was a bit of a challenge. Have your wife do it, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> you mean my roommate? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that next time, Pete, and we'll see how it goes. But anyway, so I ended up pulling out the uh, oil filter to get it out. To get more room. To give me a room. Yep, and then pop, you know, it's a little heavy, but sure, you can get it right up and out. Yep. I'm going to okay. share the uh, chat, the uh, Gustafson website. Okay, thanks, Rick. I have a question regarding these gear reduction starters. Has anybody actually done a current test on them? How much current they draw? I'm not sure, Mike. Bob or Ken, have you done that? I have not. I, no, I can't say specifically. I have to. I have to say that um, I just put one in my project that hasn't been running for years, but um, got the old one out and put it in. Moss sells, I bought it years ago. At that time, Moss sold, uh, sold one that you had to, like Bob mentioned, clock the, the starter motor so that the solenoid didn't hit the, the block. So you have to do that, but they now are selling one 
for I think it's forty dollars more that I think is is just a plug and play. But it, but uh, undoing the the bolts to the end of the starter motor and just reclocking it was pretty easy. So we'll see how it works. I know that when I did one on, um, I had a big block Chevy once and, and going from the standard GM starter to one of these high reduction motors, it was just beautiful. It's, uh, it, it started easy. It wasn't as much of a racket as the normal one was. So hopefully it'll, it'll, it st starts better. So, so Tom, is 2021 the year that we're going to get the motor started? Um, I'm hoping, or <laughs> yeah, at the end of this, the end of this year, yeah, probably. Okay. Well, once COVID's over, maybe we'll need to have a tech session out at your place. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing quite a bit to it. Good. I, I do, I do have a question too. If we get to it, um, sure. About what? Can, can I ask? Go, a go ahead. You, you got the so, floor, Tom. So, um. This came with no interior, no dash. I've gotten all these the parts and dash, and um, I it didn't have a trafficator in it. So I bought a trafficator, the one that uh, was from Taiwan. That's all set up. Um, the it, the steering uh, shaft is there, and I'm trying to. There's a center um, tube in the steering column that has a uh, a cut in it at the 12 o'clock position. And the trafficator is supposed to stick in that. That's what I understand. So the trafficator has like four different bumps on that, the tube of the, the trafficator, uh, the stator tube, I guess yep. it's called. Stator right? tube, yep, you got that right. The way, the, the way that this reproduction is made, the, the bumps are actually 100, well, they're on the opposite side. It should be 12 o'clock position, but it's down at the, um, you know, the six o'clock position. Do, can I change that tube, just turn the tube in the uh, column, or do I have to reconfigure the trafficator, disassemble it and re-move uh, the, the stator tube? Yeah, it's actually very mm -hmm. easy. You just loosen the nut on the bottom of the steering column about half a turn and then you'll find you can rotate it and then lock it up again on the bottom of the steering column. Okay, so I don't have to disassemble the trafficator it should just to do the tube. Okay, perfect. And Bob, were you gonna say something too? Excuse me? Were you gonna say something? You look like you were about to I, say I something. Was, I was gonna say the same thing, yeah. Okay. You do have to- the nut you have to... the twirl and, and assuming the tube is still sticking out of the nut, uh, out of the olive yeah. nut. It is, yeah. Okay. You do have yeah. to, you do have to be careful uh, when you tighten that olive nut that the, it doesn't rotate again. So you might need a second person to hold the stator tube in position while you tighten the olive nut because it'll rotate and then it'll unclock itself. Okay. Ask me, Randy, if you want, call Dave's wife and he, she'll come over and take care of it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, Tom? Tom, did, did I, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I didn't know. Yeah. You. Okay. Peter, I just have one comment on the, uh, the stars. I don't think Gustafson can sell directly to us. Cause I called him a couple of years ago when I needed a starter and oh. there are dealers that do that. And I sent you a site that he sent me to, uh, some guy in upstate uh, in spring in uh, Saratoga Springs who is very pleasant to deal with. And he's the guy that I got mine from. I sent the site to you. Okay, good. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. So, um, so Dave also had a question for us. Dave Maruby also had a question regarding about what people use and store in their boot um, for <laughs> spares. So um, why don't we just, I, 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 I did save a, uh, whoops, sorry. Let me uh, share this so we can, uh, so let's see, will this go over? Uh, I'm gonna, okay, da um, Bob had, I mean, excuse me, um, Rick had sent one, I'll, I'll do it here. Okay, can you see my screen now or not? No. Okay, let me uh, share again. So 
There you go. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, 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 Rick, you want to share some of your thoughts as it relates to things to uh, have in your in your Healy boot? <clears throat> Rick Neville, you still there? I mean, okay. Well, I, I, I said I'll be honest, and I stole this off one of the forums. What I particularly usually carry is is a charged cell phone, a credit card, and a AAA <laughs> card, but <laughs> your mileage may vary. Uh, you know, I, th I think it all depends on, on how far you're going and, and, you know, how many repairs you're comfortable with making on the side of the road. Uh, you know, this seems to be a pretty good list. And uh, the one thing that I have noticed is people talk about there is a, a Tupperware container uh, that supposedly uh, is the right size to fit with inside your spare tire, you know, inside of the 15 inch wheel. You can probably look at one of those stores like containers, whatever it is, a container store, uh, to find one that you could put a lot of this stuff in there. Uh, you, you know, we can post the, the uh, spit list on the, on the our website and people can look at it. It's pretty self-explanatory. You know, I, I've known people, some, I've seen some of these lists and it looks like the person might as well just have a, you know, a, a rollback and a tow hook behind them and a trailer for all the stuff they carry. The comments weigh 5,000 pounds by the time they get done. <laughs> so I just posted, so, so I have um, the, the a bucket uh, in my spare tire. This is just over 10 inches. I got it from uh, the local hardware store. And so this is just a portion of what I store uh, in mine, but you can see I got the voltage regulator, a coil, um, your, your points, uh, your, your, your rotor um, are all things that I would recommend. Um, let's see if we're- Pete, I would recommend you get rid of that rotor. It has a rivet in the top of it. <laughs> oh, get, yeah. <laughs> get a red one, come on. <laughs> That's the broken one he put in from the last time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Peter, I'd just like to, to give you a little anecdotal thing about the rotors. Uh, friend, I have a BJ8, and a friend of mine is a 69 uh, XKE, and we were out uh, doing our little tour, and all of a sudden his car absolutely stopped. And on the side of the road, we tried to do everything, and we eventually, obviously, there was no spark, so... We eventually took the uh, distributor cap off and I took a look at the rotor and I said, you know, the rotor looks very similar to mine. We happened to be five miles from my house. So we brought, went back to the house. I had a spare rotor. Believe it or not, we put the rotor in the damn XKE and it fired up and we continue on our way. So there you go. A rotor will fit an XKE and a BJ Healy. It costs three times as much for the E-type, though. <laughs> I mean, unbelievable. But uh, so, so, Dave, it is, you know, it, and really the things you'd want to have in your, in your boot are things that you're comfortable, as, as Rick mentioned, that you feel comfortable installing on the side of the road. I mean, so that's really the, the thing that's, that's most important. Um, always, always have a rotor. Yep. And, and again, that... I've had problems with, uh, with coils. Coils have been a, I, I carry a coil in each one of my cars. They've been a real problem. I had a problem with a coil with my Healy. Yep. Yep. Isn't the red rotor the preferred rotor? Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, that's what Bob was chastising me about, Ted. Oh, okay. I, I, I missed it. <laughs> you know, some people, some people carry, especially if they're going long distances, they, they tend to carry stuff that they won't be able to find at the local you know, advance auto or even the local British places they can find one. And they'll carry, you know, like the radiator hose, that long radiator hose that goes from the top of the radiator to the bottom or the top of the, the uh, water pump. You know, things that you know, you know, it's, it's going to take two or three days to get from moss or whatever. And if you got the room, it might be a good idea to, to carry it around. One, one part I would add to the list that I carry in my car is uh, an inner tube for my cars uh, run on tube type tires. So it's it's really hard to, uh, to get an inner tube if you need one. 
Uh, so I, I throw one of those in the back. And, and the, uh, one of those bands that goes around the end of the spokes. No, that's good. Good point, Rich. Thank you. I have a suggestion. Please. Always carry a 12 volt test light. You know, the probe test light. It's the most useful tool for electrical problem. Yeah. 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 Now, so Mike, is that the one you're saying you're going to put on the end of the spark plug and into the... Oh, no, no. This is the type that has an alligator clip on one end that you put on ground and then it has a probe on the other end and a light inside the handle and you can probe around gotcha. to see what's live and what isn't. Okay. Great. I... I'd add some uh, bailing wire to that too. Um, <laughs> you know, if you need something to hold up, uh, uh, duct tape isn't going to work. But coat, coat hanger, a coat hanger would work. Yeah, coat hanger. Hung a few exhaust systems up on the road with coat hangers. <laughs> yeah, that that's a good idea. Yep. Yeah. Um, other another thing is a fire extinguisher. <laughs> And something yeah. that somebody mentioned, I think, on one of these calls within the last year was that fire stick, fire extinguisher. Yep. That is it's one that's very small, and I think it lasts five times longer if you need to use it. And it was cheaper than buying a fire extinguisher from Moss. And I haven't bought one yet, but it's on the list <laughs> to do. So, uh, and also a flashlight, good flashlight. Good point. Um, Harbor Freight, if you have one around, they sell for $25. It's a fairly long, thin flashlight. And um, it's an LED type of light with a small light on the end and then a long uh, array on the middle of it. And it's made of metal, it swivels, and, and it's magnetic on one end. And I've had one for a couple of years now and use it all the time. It doesn't take up a lot of room. It's only 25 bucks. And it holds a charge a long time. So. Not one other idea. Is, is that with a battery, Ted, or is that you recharge it with a cigarette lighter? Uh, you could do it with a cigarette lighter, but I plug it into the wall, you know, in the garage. But it, it okay. lasts a long time. So. Okay. And it's very, very handy. I, I gave one to Gabe down at his shop, and it's become his preferred light now. So, you know. there's uh, There's no mention in there of safety equipment for the driver. So uh, maybe one of those traffic uh, triangle reflective things and... Uh, mm. A reflective vest to wear if you break down at night or side of the road. Uh, people dressed in dark colors don't show up very well. Good point, Dave. Thank you. Peter. Please. The uh, MGT party uh, that I belong to, we went to uh, what they call a gathering of the faithful. And one of the guys broke a half shaft in his rear axle. I couldn't believe it. One of the members had one. Really? <laughs> Carried it with him. What are you going to do? He is carrying a half shaft in his boot. He's carrying a half shaft. You know, wow. the, the guys at the sprite owners here know that that's a, a fairly common thing to happen is to break a half shaft. And there was a, a guy who's officially known as a sprite nut, Frank Clarice, uh, from Tom's River, New Jersey, who's passed away a few years ago. And he was one of the the guys to start the, the early email lists and, and really brought Sprite people together around the world. And he used to carry one. Uh, he would bolt it on the inside of the fender of, of a Mark II uh, Sprite. He was, and he was able to get into it from the engine compartment. It used to happen so often that he'd always carry his spare. <laughs> wow. I have spare half shafts, but I can tell you, I've never carried one with me. I mean, I've got them in my spares, but I don't, wow, that's interesting. Well, the next time you break one during, yeah, during an autocross, you'll be happy you have one. You know, no, that's 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 true. That's true. I, I on my uh, on my hundred, I I broke it. I was doing maybe two miles an hour from a stop sign, and, and uh, it just snapped and bro broke right off in, in the uh, in the diff. That's what so, exactly happened to mine when I had a, my first one in high school. And the same thing, drop, driving away from a, a stop uh, light, it, it broke. And I went to the junkyard and they got one out of a Morris, uh, not a Morris, I'm sorry, a uh, Metropolitan, a Rambler Metropolitan. It was the same rear axle as a Sprite. Yeah. And I, you know, I didn't know a lot back then. And I'm looking and go, no, 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 that's not the kind of car I have, you know. <laughs> 
Pete, you need a magnet to get the broken pieces out of the differential. You certainly do. You had really, right, Dana. Yeah, mine snapped off right there at the corner of the housing. And you're right. I needed a magnet to pull it out. In there, done that. Yep. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts or recommendations, things we should be storing in our boots? Okay. Dave Barubi, any other questions on your end? Uh, no, that pretty pretty much covers, well, it covers a lot, I guess. Uh, doesn't leave much uh, luggage space for the roommate's stuff. That's <laughs> Tell your roommate to pack lightly. <laughs> she does. Well, if you leave her home, there's lots of extra space to carry Whoa. spears in the, in, to see, you know, in the, there, the Rick. compartment. You know? <laughs> Tough one there. <laughs> you notice Rick's wife's not hearing him right now. Yeah, not that right. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah d d don't leave home without the uh, without the roommate that gets dangerous so uh so don i you had a question regarding uh your bj8 and starting with the choke and the smelling of uh of raw gas and uh fuel coming out of the front drain pipe you want to give us some more insight on that yeah i um uh, i have a real issue with that i had both carburetors uh rebuilt and uh when i started up in the morning I noticed that there was a real smell of raw gas and uh, uh, just checking around, I noticed that the, in my intake, the front drain uh, was actually dripping gas out. And unfortunately it was dripping gas very near the, uh, uh, the, manifold, the exhaust pipe, which is not good as we know. Uh, once it starts up and it gets going, it, all of that stops uh, a little bit bit of other history with the carburetors are I put new floats in it and not new floats but I put new needles and uh, and actually the new needles of uh, that moss cells that supposedly are better than the old needles and in seats uh, I put that in there and everything when taking the top off the gas seems to be where it should be and not overflowing uh, very frustrating any thoughts on, on what's going on with this? Got it. Thank you. Someone have some thoughts for Don regarding uh, that uh, fuel coming out of that uh, front pipe? Is your uh, is your fuel pump a standard uh, SU fuel pump? Uh, funny thing that you asked that. Uh, I've had fuel pump. I've had MGAs and and Heelys for years and. I finally decided that I was going to get a solid state fuel pump, which is the best thing I ever did with that car besides electronic ignition. So I have a solid state fuel pump on that instead of the traditional pump. It makes the same sound, but it's but it's solid state. Yeah, some, sometimes a fuel pump can overdrive the fuel and, and can cause uh, overflow so it's, if the fuel pressure is a little high. But how do you control that? You can get you can put an inline uh, control pressure control. What, what when you say a solid state, do you mean an SU solid state? Yes. Oh, then it should be okay then if it's an issue. Fine. Yeah, I got this through Moss. It was like a hundred and whatever it was, it was the best thing. Yeah, There's all those damn points forever. But it's like it's like it's the same as a, a, a an SU pump. It's just a solid, no points. Yeah, yeah make that, that shouldn't be clicking issue. noise, everything. Yeah. Did you say you put new needles in it or gross jets? So no, no. I the 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 float, the float needles and the seats. I put, I replaced those, thinking that that might be an issue. It sounds like it could be the issue, but I'm wondering if you got some defective ones. You know, you know, I thought about that, and almost, uh, I thought I read somewhere where someone was saying that those aren't the good ones you should use the original ones instead that's you know, what i mean i know the i know the i had gross jets yeah uh, yeah that's what these are these these are all self-contained some of them have been now i thought they fixed it but i had them a number of years ago and they leak like a sieve the same thing you know so what do you think a period put, the, put the old buy old jets or old needle valves in now that's, that's probably not going to correct your problem when you're choking your car. The drains are on the intake manifold, 
so that the extra fuel that's dumped in can drain out if, if too much gets in there, which right. will happen when you pull the choke more than the car can handle. I know that the knob will come out if it's working right, the choke knob will come that far out and pull that needle so far down that it will over choke the car. And instead of flooding the, 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 the spark plug, the drain is there for that reason. Now the, the drain tubes should be long enough to run all the way down and bypass the, the exhaust manifold or the downpipes. But you're still angled so that the fuel doesn't drip on the downpipe. So but you're still going to smell down. that fuel. You're still going to smell it unless you don't choke the car quite so much. So you think adjusting the choke cables? Adjusting um, the choke I, cables could do it. Or I, not pulling the choke quite as far. Right. Yeah, don't pull it as far, Don. Just have a question about this. Are you talking about the manifold drains or the carburetor float bowl drains? Drains. No, the, the the intake manifold has two drains. Yep. Okay. This is the front drain that drips. I have had difficulty with gross jets. They seem to be affected by um, fuel that's got uh, ethanol in it. Yeah. Well, well, that's the problem. We got fifteen percent ethanol in our fuel now. Exactly. I think I'd go back to solid solid needles rather than the, the ones with the neoprene tips. You think? Yeah, I think that, so. that's a that's a start. Okay, I think so. That's where I'd look for sure. Okay. Um, all right, that's fine. I'll, Ken, I'll... any thoughts on your end? Well, one thing that that I'm thinking is when the carburetors were rebuilt and so on, were the floats checked to make sure that they didn't pick up any fuel inside? Because you can you can set the float height, but if it has fuel in it, it's not going to be correct when it's put together. And yeah. that's that's going to tend to pump extra fuel through the carburetor. Yeah, I I, I read the, the manual where you put the, you know, when you're checking that float adjustment and you put I don't know three eighths drill bit and and that how you adjust the uh, the float or the the needle valve right but i i'm talking about if you if you take the if it's a brass float and you take that and shake it next to your ear you might hear some sloshing in there no no i already did that no both are fine yeah. even well even, even checking when i took the just the top off itself you know the, the the fuel is exactly where it should be in those in the the chamber. Yeah. Well, then, uh, as Bob said, it's probably just extra fuel from choking it that uh, has to go somewhere rather than dump into the engine. So I shouldn't adjust the choke. Just don't choke <laughs> it as much. Yeah, or not as not as long a period of time. Mm. Okay. So Don, will it start if you don't pull the choke out all the way? Yeah, and when it's cold, no, it's going to pop and fart forever. Yeah, no. we all do that. What's that? We all do that. <laughs> yeah, this is like a, B, it this is like a BJ8 to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a you know, it's a, it's a great car, and uh, it's uh, but it's it's frustrating, especially when I get in there with my wife and she says, uh, you know, it smells. Anyway, it stinks. Have, have you, uh, have you <laughs> has your timing been checked lately? Yeah, yeah, I did the timing also. Yeah, I've been I've been right through this. The engine's been rebuilt, uh, you know, several years ago. I'm the second owner of this car, so it's. Um, well, maybe don't start the car with your wife in there. <laughs> well, or get it warmed up before she gets in the car. Yeah. Or drive it for five miles before this the smell goes away. Oh no! I don't know. Really. But, yeah, but, right. I, but I'll tell you that what, shouldn't be the case. That absolutely yeah. shouldn't be the case. Once you get the thing started and it's running with the choke in, you should not smell fuel. Right, right. Well, it's, it's dripping down. I'm going to tell just another little story. On the end of that, that drain pipe, there's a little uh, rubber drain also that goes down below near the frame. And believe it or not, that 
got on the exhaust manifold and sealed it closed. Wow, that was not that, that. That is that's the float chamber drain. That's a totally different thing from the manifold drain. You've got to be careful. You're talking about the right things here. Yeah. If the if the float chamber drain is blocked, the carburetor will flood because it gets air locked. Yeah. Yeah. So I I took care of that issue. Uh, I just have one other little quick quick question. So that that sounds like it's going to be. Uh, a good thing. My trunk, the smell, talking about gas again in the BJ8, I've replaced that hose from the fill pipe to the tank. Nothing in there is leaking at all, but it's a nasty smell in the trunk. Is there, is everybody's had their, their trunk always, always smells. I mean, you can't put a blanket or anything in that trunk. I mean, it's, it's nasty. I would suggest you've probably got a leaky fuel tank. No, if you, I would notice it on the ground. If you look at the more likely, more likely at, it's your fuel sending unit. Yep. Right. Yes, good that, that that is held in with six uh, BSA screws, and you'll get fuel leakage or vapor leakage coming up through those screws. It comes with a little cork gasket, but you're probably going to have to put some other sealant along there and seal each of the screws or put some sealant on each of the screws before you drive them down in. And if they're tight enough and you put enough sealant in there, you should be able to stop the vapors from coming out of there. Okay, I'll try it because when I first got the car, that was one of the things that I had to replace. So I did replace that. That Again, that was one of the first things. That was like over 10 years ago and maybe I'll visit that again. Okay, the other place to look when you're when you have the, the trunk liner out and you're looking at that fuel sender is there is a thin metal piece on on the very top of it that's held down with a couple of screws and that has a neoprene gasket in it. that chamber where the rheostat is will actually fill with gasoline and fuel smells can leak out of that flat plate on top so take the two screws out of there and look at that and see whether that neoprene gasket is in good shape as well. Now, if, if it's not a little silicon or something, is that what you recommend? Yeah, something that, that, that will will withstand the gasoline or the, the, uh, the, the alcohol gas that we're all using now. You can, you can buy the gasket sets from Moss. They'll yeah. sell you just the fuel sender gasket sets. But we put them together with brand new gaskets and still have them stinky or leaking vapors or, or some fuel, which of course immediately evaporates and stinks up the trunk. So whenever I put one in, I always use, you know, I, I've said it before, I think on the calls, I use a product uh, that the Japanese motorcycle companies have. And you can buy it as Honda Bond or Yama Bond, or Kawasaki Bond, or any of those, any Japanese motorcycle shop will, will have that in the tube and it will it, it withstands gasoline very well. It's a non-hardening sealant that, that I spread on with you know, a finger full will, will go a long way. And I use that. Japanese motorcycles are, are the engines are put together without any gaskets at all. They just okay. use this Honda Bond or Yama Bond stuff. It, so it's, it's so really that a good product. That replacement pipe that I put on has nothing to do with that that odor. No, no, okay. it probably is not. Okay, great. All right, thank you. But you Don, the other thing is, it, you know, that your trunk liner has any fuel come up through it? Because you know, via that trunk liner, uh, it it, it uh, retains the gas too. If, if anything's coming out of the top of that sending unit too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the only thing I keep in there is a jack and spare parts. So, uh, okay. But what I'm saying is, take that trunk liner out. And okay. see if you can smell fuel there, and uh, try to clean that up too. Well, that's not a bad idea, especially around that sending unit. Right, that's where it, it, it comes. And if you overflow, if you overfill the tank, it can sometimes come up through that sending unit. Okay, great. If you're getting any leakage there. Okay, well, this is my first time with this Zoom, and it's it's been great. And uh, I have questions next month, so uh, uh, I'll see you then. Well, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us, Don. So, so now we're Alan. I see you're on the call. 
Um, so Alan shared some pictures. So let me uh, let me uh, share that. Uh, Alan's got some challenges with uh, his um, sprite and the wiring. Where, is, where the pictures go? Um, Alan, so you want you want to why don't you start your discussions and I'll bring those pictures up, Alan. Okay. First, so first question is um, the, the car came. It's a 1275 engine and it came with the uh, uh, the Dynamo slash generator. And um, I think I've mentioned before that uh, I'm going to need more electronic, more power to the to the car. So I looked online and, and uh, you know, I guess at one point they had these a Lucas alternator for the car. So I found a uh, a replacement for that Lucas alternator, alternator, which as far as I can tell, it, it was about a 34 amp alternator um, that the car would have come with. This the one I got has a is 110 amps, but the same form factor. So my first question is, I've I've watched on how guys have, have flipped you know changed over to an alternator, wiring wise it's it doesn't seem like it's unreasonable. But the um the recommendation from the manufacturer is to go through the solenoid you know get yourself it, there's a uh, um a knot in the back of the alternator where the power comes out. And you know, go with a uh, like a four gauge wire to the to the solenoid, which will take you to the battery, and that seems like it makes sense. But in the there's a uh, brown and yellow wire that is right now coming out of the back of the uh, of the generator. Yeah, so Alan, you you, I got your picture yeah. posted. Perfect. Yeah, there you go. You actually see it. So that brown and yellow wire go finds itself back to the external voltage regulator. Um. And it, and it says in the in the documentation that I should connect that also to the same terminal that's going to go to the solenoid. My question to the group is: At 110 amps coming out of the back of the alternator, will I cook that wire? You won't have 110 amps coming out of the back of the alternator because the alternator that's will one. be self-limiting. Uh, it's it's, oh, okay. it's self-regulating. The regulator should be in the alternator, so it's it's not going to put out 110 amps all the time. If you start drawing that much, then I don't know what you would put in your car to be drawing 110 amps. <laughs> if you're trying to use it like 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 Dave was to weld your frame, like, you might need you might have that much. Every, I'm, but. I'm just trying to keep my <laughs> options open because you never know when you got to you know <laughs> you got to light up a football field, but the. Uh, uh, I mean, okay, that that actually that that I'm just limited on my knowledge of alternators and that kind of stuff. But but I understood that the alternator had a you know built-in voltage regulator. So so now I I assume I guess first off it sounded like um, you know that the cable from the back of the alternator to the solenoid cable, which is where the uh, uh, solenoid where the battery terminal is. Do I need four four gauge? That's what I, I'm, I'm looking it up. It says if you're gonna go less than five feet, you want a four gauge. Uh, like a battery terminal cable is that is that overkill i i just rewired an alternator yeah can you hear me yeah we yeah. hear you Fred. i'm new to Go this ahead. so i'm i'm new to the whole group uh, i just went through that on my bj8 uh rewiring an alternator and um i believe it was a four no, not a four uh, uh a 10 gauge wire that i put from the back of the alternator to the starter solenoid and the other two wires on the back of the alternator, one went to the ignition light, and the yeah. other is an excite wire that really just goes right back to the alternator. So that when the alternator starts to uh, spin, the excite wire tells the alternator to start putting out power. Yeah, yeah. No, I saw, I saw that. So uh, I, I guess my question really was the because uh, this is a, there'll be a brand new wire from the back of the alternator. To like I said, they, they just recommended to go into the solenoid where the you know the battery, the, the positive from the battery because the car is negative ground now. Um, the positive from the battery goes to the alternator relay, right? There's like I think they call it sorry a solenoid the solenoid relay, right? And um, they you know just I, my understanding was, was go from that terminal in the back of the alternator to that to that uh, the same spot where the battery goes in. Right. So, but do I need, it's only about a two foot or a foot run, a foot and a half run. 
is, is four gauge wired? Uh, I guess it, it won't matter, will it? Will it hurt, what, is it too much? So here's what you're talking about, right, Alan? Yeah, In yeah, terms. yeah. I think that's called a solenoid regulator. I'm sorry, I said the wrong word. A solenoid relay. <clears throat> yes. Right, because it's you can see the two wires, right? So the two wires are one's going to your to the switch in the on the on the dashboard, right? And uh, so when you turn that over, it, 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 I, my understanding is that the relay kicks in and then power goes from the battery to the to the starter through that through that switch. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So where do you see that red wire right now? I was going to go from that terminal to. I'm actually going to put a. I mean, a fuse, an inline fuse. Even somebody said put a fuse in there, like a, a hundred amp fuse. Um, you know, again, I'm reading stuff off the internet. I have no idea if people are correct or not. Hundred amp fuse is quite a fuse. No kidding. Well, <laughs> and apparently, it, it, if you got a if you got a hump humping stereo system, apparently that's not an uncommon thing. Um, but uh, I don't know. It, it, so I didn't even know if I need the fuse. But but the point was, you can see that's a that's a four gauge wire right there. That red wire. That's that's four gauge. Standard like battery terminal wire. Yeah, but yep. that wire is carrying all of the power that's got to turn over the starter. That's why both those wires, the red and the black one, are so heavy. Yeah. For for, I think that you'd be well protected if you had a ten gauge wire coming from the back of your alternator to that red terminal. That would be plenty. If you want to fuse it, you can't go wrong. I mean, I don't know what you. I, I have no idea what you're going to be doing to need 110 amps out of your <laughs> alternator, but if that's what you're putting in, if that's what yeah. you bought, then yeah. use a 10 gauge wire oh, infusion. And, and if it, if, I don't know, wait a minute, I can't say that because I don't know how much amperage a 10 gauge wire can actually carry. I think Alan was talking about putting seat heaters in and yeah, uh, <laughs> no, no, really, and stereo. Uh, uh, well, not a you know, the stereo is only fifty five watt. That's not a. It's not that bad. But but they're Miata seats and they're heated. Oh, right? right. And so I didn't. That's what. That's a whole. Not, I know I can't ask this group about the Miata seats uh, <laughs> wiring because I'm I'm trying to figure that out too, which is not. An, I may have to take this car to a Miata guy. Because I, I, it's hard to figure that out. You got a special wiring harness, but anyway, I think you. So I, I it, it didn't seem like it'd be a problem if I something use something low, um, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, low gauge like four gauge, and then it's just it is what it is. Um, uh, but I guess ten gauge might work too. It's just a question of how much draw you're gonna have, right? On that one. So, so I think. I think, Alan, you've gone beyond some of our capabilities here. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we're not no, that I, smart. <laughs> no, I, I was looking for what Bob about what Bob Abbott was going to tell me, and I, I think he answered my question. So, so um, that's, that's one, a, one one thing you can do is they sell a pass through, basically a dummy regulator that yeah. takes the place of your old one. Yeah, and it has a fuse in it. Oh, it actually has a fuse in in the okay. box, and then it's just a pass through. It's just a dummy thing. They give you the wiring instructions. You, you set it up. It looks like it's standard, but it's yeah. just kind of providing a place for you to connect your wires. That's all. So I've been watching guys doing uh, TR6 uh, turnovers or TR4 alternators. It's the same kind of setup. And, you know, they use that. They'll use that external voltage regulator because some people want to keep it there. So it looks right. Kind of like, it looks that's nice. What Dave's saying. Yeah. And then, uh, OK, so that's 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 the other option. Yeah, I mean that's what I, I have a dummy uh, voltage regulator in the two my two sprites that are running alternators. Okay. So great. if you to look at it, you wouldn't know. Yeah, okay. Looks, looks like a standard um, voltage regulator, but obviously because the voltage regulator is inside the alternator now, you don't so you don't need a separate voltage yeah. regulator. No, yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. So and then you know like I got to rewire the car to get all that stuff to work and. Um, uh, no. So, so you know, there's a place. The... There's a place called Rhode Island Wire I, that yeah, can but... do do custom wiring for you, Alan. Yeah, I'm with you. Now, yeah, they're expensive. Well, yeah, <laughs> I but... looked at it. I looked at how much that you know. They're happy to take my money. I'm, but then I don't learn as much, and I can't offer, you know, for the next guy who wants to do this. Uh, second question, totally different. 
this particular car has a has a big cable for the heater, right? So in the front of the car is the baffle, whatever they call it, that let yep. you know it, it's got a yep. flip. Fly. Fresh air. So fresh air. On, on the yeah yeah there you go. I guess it's a fresh air thing. It so is. <laughs> this car didn't have the cable, and I have a, I had a bug eyed sprite um, that had it, it, it that that same cable mechanism was like up higher like between the blower and the uh and the in the box the little box yeah, the question the is heater box so that cable that sorry that cable has got does dual duty or did originally it turns on the blower motor and you pull it out and it's supposed to open that that valve right right you cannot find that cable any or sorry they do not make that cable in this century yeah you um, i found i found my replacement for my sprite in England. Right. Could you get it from age spares or uh, eBay, I, went, I went on eBay UK and found one for sale and had it shipped over. That's how I found my replacement for my Sprite, for my bug eye. So yeah, I, Dave I, flew all the way to England to get it back. That's right. Sold. I'll, I'll <laughs> do that deal. After COVID's over, I'll, I'll do that deal. But but I can't find it. I haven't had any luck like that. And, and that's reasonable. Um, so I guess that I did find I just I, I just found a long I found something that it, it just came from Amazon, um, but it won't have the switch in it. So now I have to flip the I have to you know figure out how to how to turn that. I was going to ask, are there any other options besides eBay? Well, a lot of a, a lot of people will will do just a cable pull and then a, a separate switch for the for the blower if they give up. But if you want <laughs> the actual original type where it rotates and pulls, yeah. You're gonna to have to hunt, and I, like I said, I found mine. I found two of them for bug eyes in England on eBay.uk, and had them shipped over. So the bug, the bug eye one is shorter, right? It, it is, yeah. yeah. This one, that's yeah, and so so um. And I have one that's long, like you need. I actually have one, but I don't know that the switch will work. So what? And so yeah, actually, so I have a I have a short one that um, Bruce gave me because I, I anyway I sold a bug eye to, to Bruce, and uh, but he had one from a. The, one of the sprites, the original sprites, they didn't have such a long cable. Right. Um, so I bought the book that last time you guys said I should buy that complete sprite book. Or the, the, the original, you, original yeah. sprite book. Yep. And it tells you the whole story about like when they switched over and, you know, yep. and then they started with the, with the you know, when that, that tube moved. Um, so, okay. Um, so, so I have, a, I have, like, I have a short one, but I, I don't know how you make a short one long, uh, but I don't know if that's what you are I have. We all have that problem. We all, we all want to know that. <laughs> I have one in stock, but I'll sell you. Oh, okay. So Mike that? Salt has got one for you in okay. Canada. Hey. Eh? Yep. There <laughs> you go. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I will get your details. So, Alan, I'll send you and Mike an email, so I'll introduce you guys. Okay. Thank you. All right, that's that's perfect. Um, thank you very much. That that that, that covers my, my time allotment. I appreciate it today. Peter, I, I wanted to thank uh, Michael for joining us as well. For those of you who don't know, Mike is a uh, longtime Healy guy, emigrated from Australia originally to Canada. Uh, no? New Zealand. New Zealand. Oh, my God. Be careful, <laughs> Rick. He's a, he's a Kiwi. <laughs> uh, my apologies. And uh, 100S driver and Tiger Newfoundland guy and... Uh, really quite uh, knowledgeable so we're very fortunate to have him with us pleasure to be here yes thanks mike for joining us are there other questions this evening yeah i have one pete please yeah dave Baruby again yeah. uh on the B bj8 the valve covers um mine has a uh an austin uh a, a metal plaque it's actually like pop riveted Yep. the valve cover and then just to the left of that is the um is um uh, a sticker for the point setting i believe it is no, uh, yeah for the valves uh, valve sorry valve setting that's correct yep sorry about that right so i'm questioning that austin plaque is that supposed to be like screwed or pop riveted to the valve cover or is it supposed to be like a sticker well originally they were pop riveted weren't they well, the early cars were actually solid rivets, not pop rivets, and the later cars they were glued on or with an adhesive. Oh. But the sticker is something that's happened after that. That that's that's not 
original per se or no, not they correct. Were, the early the later bj8s actually was still had the they had the adhesive stickers but it, what what was it that thin sticker mike or was it actually a, a thicker no it was quite thin it was like a, it was like a decal it wasn't okay. that, it was not the thick aluminum piece that was okay i'm sorry okay so Dave, you're looking for a new one or replacing the ones you have or? I'm not sure what I'm doing yet. I just uh, wanted to know what was correct, I guess. Does your, does your rocket cover have holes in it for rivets? Yes, it looks like it does, yes. Then, your, then yours would have had the rivet on type. I think Moss sell them. I've got some if you need them. But I think Moss sell them in there, but you have to use a solid rivet because solid if you rivet. use a pop rivet, the oil leaks through the pop rivet. Gotcha. No, I, I know the difference. I just, I said pop rivet. I should have said solid. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so Mike, how do you install those solid rivets? Ah, uh, well, it's, <laughs> you put the rivet through the hole with the thing and you turn the valve cover upside down and you tap it with your ball peen hammer very okay. carefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you, you can't use a gun with that the way you would with a pop rivet. Got it. Okay. Good. Good to know. I got a question, uh, Pete. Please go ahead, Dave. Um, I'm just putting LED. This is an LED light conversion on a BN1, and um, the, the headlights and the headlights are fine. Did the four marker lights slash turn signal slash tail lights, and the turn signals work when none of the lights are on. They flash normally, but as soon as the lights are turned on, the headlights or marker lights are turned on, they don't flash anymore. Does anybody uh, have any experience with an LED conversion? Did you get the ele electronic flasher you have to get? It does. Yeah, it does have an electronic yeah. flasher and it's, and they do flash and work when none of the lights are turned on. But as soon as you turn on the headlights or the marker lights, um, <laughs> they don't flash anymore or they sounds, flash extremely fast. Sounds faint. like resistance in the ground somewhere. Now I, I, I read on, I saw something online on the Moss site about putting ballasts in when I need some. Ballast resistors, yes. Yeah, well, that'll fix that problem. <laughs> On the grounds to those lights, between the between the bulb ground and the body, you install a ballast resistor, and theoretically, that should help your situation. Okay, all right. So, so Dave, you see what Mike's <laughs> holding up? Mike's holding up one of those resistors. Yeah, that's that's. I just ordered two of those today. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can get Barb to install it for you, Dave. <laughs> I, she, she presses the brake pedal. <laughs> I have a quick question, Pete. Uh, it, um, Bob was saying uh, you had a red rotor. I've had, I've been carrying this rotor in my car for many. I bought it from Moss. How can I, how can I tell if this is a good one or a bad one? Color. Wrong color. It's not red. Wrong color. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't have a ribbon. Ask somebody no. who's not colorblind. No rivet, it's okay. <laughs> no rivet. It's so okay. it's okay? Yep. Okay. The problem was that they, when they pushed the rivet, they pressed the rivet into the rotors, they used to crack the rotor. And then current went from the high tension arm on the rotor down onto the distributor gun. So if it doesn't have a rivet, it'll be fine. Rich, you'll need to paint that one red, though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to paint that red and paint, go out and paint my half shafts tonight. <laughs> Can I ask a question about a dimmer switch? Sure. Go ahead, Fred. Uh, I just did a uh, headlight relay for the BJ8. And uh, of course, you know, the, I just got the car. I've had the car since September and I've been working on it ever since. The um, when I, uh, I got into the dimmer switch, I, I found out that the previous owner who had just installed a new interior and new carpeting or had it installed, the dimmer switch is held in place by two sheet metal screws going into the carpet. They don't go through the, through the body of the car. So I was able to just pull it right away. Now, it, the, the carpet is glued down. On the other side of the footwell is the heat shield, the ceramic heat shield. So I can't see where or how the dimmer switch is, is held in. Is it sheet metal screwed? Does anybody know? Is it bolted through? No, there are two captive nuts in there. And probably what happened was, was when they uh -huh. went to remove it, the cap, the screws that went into the captive nuts snapped off and uh, were too hard to... Uh, do something else. So we did an alternative, easy 
fix. Or is there a possibility to put new floors in without the captive nuts? Yeah, there's that too. So, Fred, have you seen, uh, do you have any idea if yeah, the cars had fl floors replaced? I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any evidence of that underneath of it More about anywhere. I don't see any welds or intrusion or, or anything. I mean, I've, I was probing around with a pick, you know, trying to see if I could find out where the holes are. I'm not even sure where the dimmer switch is supposed to be. Well, no. on the, on the left-hand side of your footwell, to the left of the clutch pedal. Yeah, up against you, you the know uh, vertically you know how if where look, if you, you have been proving with an ice pick trying to find a hole you know hoping can that, you get can you if, if if like rick said the screws were 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 wrung off because they were rusted in you're not going to be able to get a pick and find it find a hole with a pick but if you look under the car you should be able to see where the old nuts were welded to the to the floor of the car and that right. will give you an idea of the orientation of the spot where they should be. The sheet metal screws. Now, does your dimmer switch have a bracket that it's mounted yes. to? Okay. The, bra the bracket so, is there. So it's not correct, but the simplest fix is going to be just to take some longer self-tapping sheet metal screws and just just find as close Drive as you in. can to where that, that dimmer switch bracket should be mounted and run the, the self-tapping screws right in and they'll drill their own hole and, and drill it down and drill it very tightly and hold everything down. That's the simple fix. It's not the correct way to do it, but you may never be able to, to get those broken off screws out of there since the car is all finished, the carpet's all in. You, yeah, you and on the, on the back side is the, is the ceramic heat shield. Well, so I and, and I was going to take that out, but I didn't know if those screws are captive or if they're, you know, I don't, I don't. The screws would have gone into a captive nut. Okay. And the heat shield should be uh, spaced away from the from the floor of the car, so there's room down there. But to locate them, you're right. You're going to have to remove that heat shield to be able to see where those captive nuts are. Actually, the um, they they room. weren't. There weren't captive nuts uh, to hold the bracket in. They were actually separate loose nuts and nuts and bolts held those on. There were no captive nuts in the floor originally. The floor didn't have welded nuts on it? No, there no. were, were nuts and bolts with spring washers. Really? Yeah. On a BJ8 too, Mike? Yep. So I have an alternative. Just to make uh, it easy, you know. Fair enough. I have an alternative for you. Um, I, I don't like uh, self-tapping screws. I don't like the way they look and I don't like catching my, my hands on them when I'm trying to work on the car. I, I found this tool that you drill a hole and it, it's like a pop rivet type of thing. It, it um, you find the nut the size that you need. It's got a, uh, have you guys ever seen this thing and, and you can put it in the Rib hole? Rib what? Yeah. Rib nut. yeah, but it, it, yeah. So you can, it, it, yeah. I mean, the tool that I have does like M4 through M5, M, you know, up to M10, right? And the same so it's thing. It's all with, metric. Well, no, it, it does both, right? So it's, okay. And, it, it, and you get, it's like a little, you just got to, you change the head out. But it basically, it acts like a pop rivet in the sense that you, you pull it to close it, but then you can put a nut in it, right? Then you, whatever size nut you're, you're kind of dealing with, right? And all you had to do is drill a hole in the sheet metal. You put because it goes through the front and, and you just did and uh it's some Chinese tool but it works awesome. <laughs> and I've been using that like all over this little sprite. So I can get rid of those those damn uh, that's not gonna know. have anything English left on it. It's gonna be all Japanese in a minute here. Uh, it's, it's uh you know, but it works good, you know, and it's everything's <laughs> in a nut and it's in a washer. It's uh, you know, there's it's uh I mean whoever did the re restoration on this card was was uh screw tap crazy, you know, and uh and it's just because you can't weld. I mean, it's all painted. You can't be welding Captain Nuts on. Right? No, that kind of good stuff. So, so Fred, so, you were saying that the carpeting's all glued in. Is that even the, the, the floor carpeting is glued in, Fred? It, it, it Yes. The, uh, the It's got like a hush mat. Under. Matter of fact, when I got the car, okay. you know, like most of you would do, I wanted to check all the fluids, change everything. When I went to check the transmission fluid, yep. I couldn't find the rubber. Yep. Underneath there was a flap in the yeah because it would oh. hush mat it over. 
He just, who somebody just hush matted over everything. So I had to find that the oblong rubber plug for the tray right. with a with a pick, cut out around it and pull that out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is, I'm sorry. This is BJ8. BJ8. Yeah. So you had to remove the console too. Could could you get to it with the console still in place? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're okay. Yeah. I was able to cut it out. The rubber plug is where it was where it belonged. Yep. And uh, and the fluid in the transmission tunnel. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Well, what I really, I, if somebody, you know, is a, could somebody get, send me a picture of where this dimmer switch should be approximately? I yeah, mean, I can do that even how, just measure how far up it should be, in, you yeah. know. Uh, I mean, right I, now I it's, right down, see... it's right down at the very bottom of the foot well. Um, yeah. Not that it's got to be exactly correct, but maybe I can find where those holes are. Maybe. You'll, you'll probably have to take the asbestos heat shield off. Bottom, really to yeah. do the job properly and it's not that big a job it's held in with rib nuts people. sounding better and better yeah. <laughs> <laughs> aren't you glad you don't do it for a business yeah? <laughs> well thank you you're welcome it's Fred. getting, well, it's getting a bell exhaust on it next week <laughs> okay there you go nice okay i ordered it in november it came two weeks ago Oh jeez! <laughs> now, are you doing that yourself, or are you going to have someone do it for you? That's going to be that. That's about the only thing that's going someplace as of so, so far. That's only other. Somebody's and Fred, where, where do you live? Ocean City, New Jersey. Great. Well, well thanks for joining us. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Hopefully, you've been, enjoyed this evening. So we do this the second Monday of the month. Fantastic. Yep. And appreciate it. So, so are there other questions that anyone has this evening? Uh, yes, this is Daryl Baskerville. I'm new to the club. Please go ahead, Daryl. Yes, I have a uh, BT7 that I'm uh, looking for engine rebuild resources uh, near me. I live in uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut. So, if anybody had any experience with any shops near me in either uh, Fairfield County or New Haven County? So, you, so Daryl, in your email, you'd mentioned that um, the engine's frozen. Correct. It needs. The engine is being taken out of the car. I'm taking it out of the car and I want to have it rebuilt. And uh, so hopefully I could find some place close to where I live. Well, I mean, I, I just to make a comment. It's more important to have it done properly than location of where it's done in all honesty. No, I, I agree. I mean, yeah. having yeah. both of those together would be great, but uh, ultimately you're right. It has to be the right uh, competent uh, shop to do the work. Right. So, so right above you is Ken Beck. He's down in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, Bob Abbott, who's in Ipswich, Mass. They are both two very reputable um, people that could, could rebuild your motor for you. Um, anyone have any recommendations of someone in Connecticut? Ted Kiesling, any recommendations that you have? You're in Connecticut. You're, you're up in the Hartford area, right? I don't know. I... I would go to Mass uh, up in Mass there. That's where I would go. Well, okay. You mean, you mean Bob <laughs> Abbott? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the only place I would go. Well, Bob Abbott I, in Massachusetts, and where'd you say uh, Ken Beck was in uh, Pennsylvania? Yeah, Ken, you want to give him your information? Yeah, we're in, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So, okay. Yeah, so He's it's done. Ken. So, so Daryl, I'll send an email um, and copy both Bob and, and Ken, and you can, you know, talk to them and see what uh, what could possibly work for you. That would be great. I appreciate it. Yeah, Bob's business is in Ipswich, Mass, and, and Ken's in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Okay. I live in, I live in South Windsor. I live in South Windsor, just a little north of Hartford. I, I'd be willing to get on, pick up the engine, and take it up with you. Great up idea. Mass. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm serious. I'd help you do it. Ted Cryer? Okay. It, Ted, Ted it, right? Yeah, yeah. Ted. No, Ted Cryer. Cryer. Ted, are you on there somewhere? Yeah. Is, is Which Ted do you want? Is Ted Cryer. Oh, no. Ted, Ted was Ted on was earlier. Right? I know, so, 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 Ted, I mean, so I'll, he uses Highland Automotive in New York. Yeah, I was wondering. That's what I was going to ask him whether Peter Genovese is still doing motors. Well, and Gabe Del Judas. Yeah. Now, Peter's the engine guy, so is he okay? Yeah, uh, Highland Highland Automotive in Highland, New York, which is right 
at over the end the of uh, 84, right in the uh, Poughkeepsie area. They okay, do pretty well. Uh, so, so I'll send you an email somewhere. with all those contacts. Ah, uh, that's exactly what I was looking for. I appreciate you, that. You can reach out to them. Or Mariana, anyone that you know in Connecticut? Let's say the, the big guys are in Stratford, Automotive Restoration Inc. Uh, and then just beside Stratford, there's a small shop with a dad and a son that they are doing only the rectification of the of the block. That they have a small shop, but they are very good. So that is, I think Stratford here in Connecticut is is the best thing I know. Stratford Care, you called it? Stratford, and the, the place is uh, Ari, Automotive Restorations, Inc. I would send the, the information to Pete. Thank okay, you very thanks, much. Mariano. Hey, this is fantastic. <laughs> okay, great. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, and, and again, you, you may not be in your backyard, Daryl, but again, I would recommend go to the right people than just having someone, you know, close by. Oh, oh absolutely. I was hoping I could get the right people in my backyard. If not, <laughs> I go to the right people. Right. <laughs> Don't we always want it that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, well, again, Ted Kiesling's offered to to give you a hand with moving the moving the motor as well. So, well, so when are you gonna, when are you going to pull the engine? Well, I'm going to pull it probably at uh, the end of this month. I got it all apart. I got it all loose and ready to pull out. I'm just waiting for weather to uh, take it out of the car. And do you have a lift? I do have a lift, yes. Oh, good. It makes it easier. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I pulled the motor out of my BJ. Unfortunately, I, I have a lift, so it makes the process much easier. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm using the manuals. Okay, sounds good. So any other questions, Daryl, or any other things you uh, want support on with your, uh, what did you say, a BT7? Uh, BT7, yeah. Not at this time, but I'm sure I will. This is a second call I've been on. This is great information I'm getting from you guys. Great. Good. So any other questions for this evening? Pete, just one simple, simple question. Um, the, the the block the wooden block that uh, supports the battery in the back I have an issue where that the right side of the trunk had been uh, or the boot had been uh, uh, replaced so it's just a blank uh, piece of metal there whereabouts is that located uh, in, in relationship to the battery is it in the middle of the battery is it the top of the battery I, I don't know where to drill the holes and put this block so you're you know, not talking about the block for the for the um, spare tire on the left hand side no you're talking about the other one the okay. other side yeah anyone help I tom on that place. Tom, uh, tom are you able to get a battery that's as thin as as the original so that you need the block um well i already bought a battery it's not as thin as the original it's a standard battery yeah you got to be but careful it still seems that. like it yeah. That block was for a very specific battery, which was quite narrow. And if you try to put a regular battery, it'll overlap the fuel tank. So you may not need that thick block. Are you are talking about the so, block that's about two inches thick? I am, I am. Yeah, no, just the your earlier cars had a block that was about three quarters of an inch thick. And that's where your, your uh, weld nuts come in. They were actually welded inside the fender. You might be able to find those. They're on the inner fender. Uh, you might find the three holes that you can just put, well put a smaller block in. Well, that that panel has been replaced on the inner oh, fender. Yeah. Um, well. <laughs> so I, I see. So so that's a, then. There's another question. So the the battery doesn't come out over the um, on, over the the tr um, fuel tank. No, it, it sits. It, it should it should stay e east of the fuel tank. And east of that uh, body panel or the- right. uh, So if, you, if you're going to use a regular size battery, put in the block, it's about three quarters of an inch thick. Okay. Good. Pete, I got one last question. Sure, go ahead, Alan. Sorry, so as Pete has, has let everybody know, I have a serious wiring problem and a, and a bad habit for electricity, but simple question, the gauge of the wire in in the dashboard area i'm gonna have to kind of rework that and i'm i can't find what size wire 
the use? 14 gauge, 15, 16 gauge, 18 gauge? For most of the wires. Any, can anyone help uh, Alan with the, the, the proper gauge for? Uh... I, would, I would say 18 or 20. It's That's quite light, it right? doesn't carry much current. There's hardly any loads through there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Rick, anything else you want to share before closing? Uh, the only thing I want to bring up is that we will be having uh, our uh, spring uh, planning meeting on Saturday, March 20th. At 10 a.m., that will be a Zoom meeting as well, and I'll send out a notice to everyone in the club, and that's when we talk about what we're going to be doing for events uh, for the uh, at least the first part of the uh, driving season. Uh, things are looking better, I think, as we're all hoping as far as the vaccine is going and uh, the latest CDC guidance as to when people who've been vaccinated can share space together. Uh, we are looking at, a, uh, at least to begin with, uh, mainly driving events, but uh, as time goes on, hopefully we can get back in the swing of things and start uh, recreating once again. Uh, one thing, uh, there's a couple of things on tap uh, for that meeting is uh, we are going to uh, take a vote on expanding the number of uh, people that we have on the board of directors, uh, just so that we will have uh, some more people that want to become involved also be on the board of directors. We, we kind of went over that at our January meeting, and this is kind of a ratification of that. Uh, the second thing of import will be, uh, we. this is when we generally choose our, uh, our charity for the year. Uh, last year, our charity was the Veterans Miracle Center in Albany, and, and they've done some fantastic work with uh, both active duty and uh, retired military and their families, providing them the necessities of day-to-day -day life. Uh, and I, 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 I can speak for myself. I thought they were a great charity. Uh, one of our uh, Wing 5 North, uh, North uh, Shore Wing uh, members, uh, Nick Sarkadis, uh, who many of you will know as being the guy that had done all our uh, graphic uh, artwork for the last number of years. I uh, had a long battle with cancer and passed away a couple of months ago. And one of the things that he was always trying to get us uh, to, to go with was the St. Jude's Charity uh, for Children. And uh, we, uh, I have asked uh, that that uh, charity be named uh, as our Charity of the Year in his honor. Uh, and so we will take a vote on that along with if anyone else has any alternative suggestions uh, they may also do that. Uh, and then we can just basically uh, shoot the bowl a little bit. Uh, normally, uh, if you attend our meetings, you get a free breakfast, but and you'll get a free breakfast this year, except you'll be providing it. <laughs> but, well, maybe yeah. Dave Baruby's wife can get his breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's, that's kind of up on the 20th. Uh, we are, we'll also do our monthly uh, AHBS call. Uh, I'm hoping to get uh, Bill Rawls uh, as I guess, but I'm, I, I haven't heard back from him. Uh, other than that, I'll, I'll find some other unwilling, unwitting victim to, uh, to help us out with that. Uh, or we'll just find something to shoot the ball about. But uh, as Peter pointed out, these have been recorded. We have uh, started our new YouTube video. And as of this evening, we now have 63 uh, subscribers to that YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel. And we also have uh, our Facebook uh, page. And we have over 200 people who are now members of that Facebook page uh, from around the world. So I would urge you to take part, share your pictures, share your Healy stuff. And if you don't make these meetings, uh, feel free to uh, to join us on uh, on the YouTube channel. However, we actually, as you can see, we, we really want to have everyone live here and not just rely on the YouTube channel because that's how we get all the material to put on the YouTube channel. So we all appreciate everyone that, that shows up for these meetings. Absolutely, yeah. So, so thank you all. So again, our next call for the, uh, the technical conference call will be on the 12th 
of uh, of April. Hopefully by then, uh, some of us will even have our, our cars out and uh, get a chance to, to get them running and, and start to enjoy. Hopefully by then, it, it, you know, the, the second weekend or the um, second Monday in April, we'll have some have some nice weather. So again, thank you all for, for joining this evening. Hope you uh, hope you enjoyed it. And again, feel free to uh, share any questions in advance. Thank you to all the, uh, the specialists and experts that joined us and those that shared any information. So hope you all have a, a great rest of uh, this week. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you, Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye.